Oh, well, I'll start with a comment about connectivity. I travel a lot in, uh, I've travelled a fair bit in South America and in countries that we would consider, well, they're less rich than, than Australia. And uh, just about anywhere you go in the countries I've travelled, there is internet access. You go to a hotel, it's free internet access. And still, uh, I can drive 30 k's outside of the national capital. We all know this. And there is no um, internet access. So, um, there's a kind of a mismatch between what governments are doing, putting so much stuff online and expecting us to engage that way, um, when we don't have that connectivity and when we still do, as we've heard today about the digital divide that leaves so many Australians, especially some of the most vulnerable, unable to access the services that they are probably most likely to need. So what can we do about that? Craig? Oh, well, um Firstly, to address the point of why we're not as connected, I think part of that is also the legacy of being a wealthy country in that a lot of the uh, developing countries have put in mobile infrastructure um, and have enabled a lot of uh, internet through that, whereas we've been tied to a copper network for a very long time and we're trying to build out on that and that actually has held us back to a large degree. So well, being a wealthy country has in some respects been a disadvantage for us going to the 21st century. Um, but in terms of it, I, th I think the first thing to consider is, uh, again, Canberra's the most connected city in Australia. Um, it's where most of the federal bureaucrats live. Um, if you look at across the public service in all the states, um, you'll find that the public servants have a higher degree of education and a higher degree of connectivity than any of the people they serve. And the number one thing, again, gets to uh, John's point about um, human-centred design. It's actually getting out there and experiencing what uh, the more marginalised communities actually experience and actually knowing what it's like to live and work in those communities. So I think actually sending a, uh, a couple of senior bureaucrats with their laptops and mobile phones out to some of these areas with no coverage and saying you have to deliver on all your usual ministerial priorities for the next week. They'll go crazy. That's the whole point. <laughs> Um, because it will actually force them to actually recognise that the rest of the world is not them and that there's an obligation in the centre to actually look after the edges of the circle because otherwise, you know, the centre just cannot sustain itself. Margaret, a, a library is expecting to have to take up more of this slack in the future. Uh, when I say slack, the, the, um, the, the need to provide places where people who don't have that connectivity or those skills to come? Um, yes, absolutely. And despite the growth in access to um, uh, wireless technology, and you know, uh, somebody commented that 80% of homeless people have access to mobile. I'd, I'd really like to understand um, where that comes from. Um, because if I look at, you know, in this large homeless uh, cohort use the State Library of Western Australia, and one of the reasons they use it is access to the net. So, the sorry? The yes, the but it's not, you know, it's the, a lot of them don't have devices or they actually have very old devices that are about to be connected off the network, disconnected off the network. So absolutely there's no um, reduction in the number of people using libraries for that sort of service and if you look at regional and remote areas and you know Canberra is worlds away from somewhere like Marble Bar or Sandstone and <clears throat> you know access to basic technology. I mean I have a story not so many years ago I went out as part of a government delegation to the Nunundurra lands which are the lands that uh, the language group and the lands that border the South Australian, Western Australian and Northern Territory um, borders. So we all flew in on a plane and it was government delegation, there were feds and state and there was someone from Telstra and one of the reasons we were out there was um, they were unveiling, they'd run uh, fibre between several of the communities. So I laughed because I was out trying to use the satellite phone to actually talk to Perth and who was next to me was the Telstra guy and he was having as much trouble as I was actually trying to use a phone out in these areas. So, you know, it's completely chalk and cheese to the sort of environment you have here and, yep, 30k out, you can't get a mobile phone uh, coverage. That's the same in Perth, you know. Last time I headed up north Bullsbrook, my phone dropped out. Now, Bullsbrook's a residential area and, you know, there's a library there, they're probably struggling for internet. So it's a real, it's a really major issue and, how the NBN is actually going to solve that. And yes, we're going to have 
you know, 85% of homes connected, but actually they're going to be homes in metropolitan Australia and the rest of Australia is atrociously um, supported in that regard. Well, where does that leave uh, governments, John, with their desire to put more and more uh, information uh, online and to expect citizens to engage online? Um, I guess at best in that kind of scenario, what you can say is, well, at least we can reduce the, the cost of serving in the metropolitan areas so we can be more hands-on where that connectivity is. And, but that's kind of a bit like an admission of defeat, really. Um, uh, I remember somebody from New Service New South Wales sort of presenting and saying, and, and when you clicked on the service uh, that wasn't online, we sort of told you where the nearest service centre was. And that's kind of a, a admission of defeat that that's not, that's not the goal. And, and the goal does, I think, require a lot of courage as a nation. I mean, somebody, as I recall, built a railway line across this country in times when it was a hell of a lot harder to get round than it is now. And I think it just needs that kind of balls, frankly, to um, get in there and um, and start doing it. It will take a long time, but it's the old you know, it's journey of a million steps or whatever it is. You, you have to start somewhere and start doing it and start connecting, and it's going to be long and it's going to be hard, and that's the nature of things. It has to, trend, if we believe, it has to just transcend election cycles or whatever it takes. Good luck with that. Yes. Uh, question? Yes. Question. Um, you've talked a little bit about technology failures when um, government puts services online and the technology doesn't work. Um, personal experience with Access Canberra, which is a fabulous online service from uh, the ACT, um, and they've got this service called Fix My Street, where you go online, you register the problem with your street, you get this wonderful automated response which says, Dear Sue, we're on the case, don't worry about it. And if you haven't had a satisfactory response within 60 days, you know, get in touch with us again. And everything seems to happen beautifully, slickly on the technology side of it. And then it goes to the people in the department and you don't hear anything ever again. H how do you actually marry up the people with the technology and make that a smooth a process? Yep. Uh, it's a very good question. And, and it's one of the, again, one of the reasons why the term digital was coined, I think, is that it's as much about culture change as it is about technology. And actually, in many ways, the, you know, if I had a choice between I could wave a magic wand and the culture would change or the technology would change, but not both, I would have the culture change by magic because it's a much harder thing to do than the technology. Um, we have to uh, change the way people think about it. I have an expression called a POPs, uh, which is a passive obstructive process pedant, uh, which people you find in, in private industry as well as government who, who are well-intentioned and they have a process and they're going to follow it. And... Uh, and they forget that actually the purpose of the process is more important than the process. And, uh, and trying to get that sort of uh, thinking that sort of says, actually, we can make this better, we can strip these things out. Whether it's online or whether it's actually in a, in a service centre, if we're asking somebody's address, I mean, still with forms, you fill them in and you have to put in your address several times. I'm sure that'll happen when I do my uh, paper ATO return this year. Um, that cultural change is different. Now, there's some things that you talk about there where I, where I happen to know that can connecting that back end back to the front end is an area of discussion. And again, it's kind of the using the digital world to actually make your views felt, like with feedback through the online channels, it's really, really valuable because it's much easier for our Access Canberra people to say, we've got to change this, we've got to invest in closing the loop on this. If there's data coming in from the citizenry saying, you're messing with our minds, you say you're doing this stuff, but we never know, please close the loop. We, ha we then have data, we can actually some real user experience stuff that we can put into it. So, again, be demanding is, is, is that red catch cry. There's also a Chief Minister talk back on 666 every Friday <laughs> where you can just ring in. Oh, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> I did not tell you to go and complain to the Chief Minister, right? <laughs> uh, another question? Yes. Oh, down here. Oops. Microphone race. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I guess I'm just picking up on John's suggestion that we be a bit more demanding and Alex's throwaway comment that terms of use are, or acceptance are nonsense. Um, could you think of ways that we as a profession could be a bit more radical and, and sort of circumvent um, government to, you know, provide better access? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> 
so, I mean, if, there's a part of me saying, come on, say something, come on, say it, say it, say it. Okay, I'll say it. Um, uh, cloud services are a wonderful thing. Um, there's this funny old thing going on, um, and I was thinking about, oh, I think I signed this form saying this could all go public, so I could be really in trouble, and somebody from Triple Six here. <laughs> um, um, but we have people within public service, and I'm sure it's have a federal and whatever, who apply for, to use cloud services. Uh, and they do that through the legal saying, I've got this contract, and they may not even know it's a cloud service and it's probably free and all the rest of it, and, and they go to legal. So we have about five of those a week. How many of those go to our IT teams? Zero. The, there's a whole bunch of cloud services out there which I absolutely caution you to be careful about and be, you know, get good advice before signing everything up. But there is a lot of stuff out there that's free and that it's good and it's valuable as long as it's used sensibly. So I use, I have a work phone. I have got 26 cloud apps on it, although officially we don't have cloud stuff. I'm using 26 applications for work stuff that uses the cloud. And is I it suggest, because you're finding it more efficient? Because it's absolutely, I can use it from anywhere. It's um, you know, it migrates seamlessly between that. Just simple things like my phone is backed up if it breaks or gets stolen or whatever. Within five minutes of it getting a new phone, I'm in operation again. And and just all the things that people want to use cloud apps for. I mean, there's this um, uh, the fix my street kind of stuff, which is you know, just delivered out of, out of cloud stuff and all the rest of it. So we have to be very careful about it, but it's a huge reservoir. And I think if we just get um, bogged down in the ooh, scary, dangerous cloud ooh, sort of syndrome, then we, we essentially get change panic and we're doomed. Do people trust cloud services, Craig? Oh, look, I, I think by and large now people trust the cloud services they don't think about. It's only if people actually think about them too much that they actually start worrying. Because we all use cloud services every day. You know, YouTube is a cloud service. Gmail is a cloud service. Facebook is a cloud service. They're all cloud services. Um, it's just simply a, a, a different way of thinking about it. It's, just, it's not storing the data on your personal computer. Um, but I think in, in terms of that original question, I think one of the key things that libraries have that a lot of other parts of government have lost is they still have a trust relationship in their community. The community comes and asks you stuff. Nobody ever goes to the, the, the front desk of a government agency and asks them for information. They go online and ask their friends you know, through Facebook or, one or, or a forum or something like that first. So the great advantage that libraries have is that people still ask you stuff. What you have to do is capture what are people asking you, capture it across all the libraries in the country to work out what people need, and take that and turn it into something that says, this is what our research is telling us Australians need, and start using that to educate government not push back against government, to actually educate government that this is what the community is looking for, the services they need, the information they want, the education they require. Um, it, a lot of that is done on an individual library by library basis, but you're not islands. You're all connected nodes uh, within basically a cloud library that goes across all of Australia and all across the world. So use that advantage, use your networks, that you already have great networks across librarians to actually gather the information and the data that allows you to push back. Is that happening, Margaret? Um, not, not in the formal sense. I think um, we're probably coming to grips with the data that we have. We've, for, for a long time, we've been about protecting the privacy of the people that use our services, and that's still absolutely an important ethical um, consideration in our profession. What we've not been good at has been anonymising what we do have and then using it and reusing it and making it more available. So I, I think we're actually starting to come to grips with that, but it, it's something that if you, you know, in response to that question, how can be, we be a bit more proactive and a bit more radical? It is something that we could um, do more of, I suspect. I mean, collaboration, I mean, collaboration is, a, is a huge emerging movement, if you like, simply because none of us have the resources to do it all on our own. And it's just learning from other people's mistakes is a terrific thing to do. Another question from the floor. Just kind of going off on that idea of collaboration. There are often um, initiatives where we can bring people together and ask the right questions and collect the information together. I guess my question for government is, A, 
how would you like it presented? Because the way it's being presented to you at the moment obviously isn't working well enough for us. And B, what do, what is it that you would suggest is the best way of government stepping away enough from what the user or the citizen needs to allow the citizen to get what they need to do? Because at the moment, those are kind of the two problems we're seeing on the ground, that someone comes in, gives us information, it goes into the ether, and that loop doesn't close. And two, it should be a relatively simple fix, and there are 62 layers of perfectly necessary and terribly important red tape. Can you sorry, just repeat the first bit of that question about the pr presenting, the presenting of... So when the information gets collected, um, say for example, I can tell you how many questions we've had on internet speed in the public libraries and the ACT over the past year, and I can tell you that because our citizens aren't as demanding as I would like them to be, and because I'm not able to tell them to complain to the Chief Minister either, what I have typically is more of a narrative and a pattern than discrete data points. And unless I have the 62 Marvel cases that have been raised, I don't have the data points in the form that would be most impressive for government. So how do we shift that? What is it that we can do to be talking in a way that is heard more? So, yeah, that's like how to... So you're saying how can librarians working on the front line, knowing what they know, seeing what they see, how can they shift that information to... How, how can they get that information up through the channels? Yeah. You're all looking at me, so I'll give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I heard fully, but... Uh, so, um, ringing me up every other day with, I've got this really neat idea, is not the way to do it. Uh, I should pay that clear. Um, there is, I think, that whole collaboration of getting a... a what wins business cases, if you like, which is where these things end up, is vision and, uh, uh, and something that is quite simple and capturing. And um, uh, somebody who should remain nameless reminded me that I said libraries are boring. Uh, <laughs> but there was, some, <laughs> there was some more context to that, which is in the context of how you get a, a business case around a library up. It's not sort of like light rail or something that's exciting or that captures attention. Uh, and I think actually... It's, it's not the quantity, but it's actually taking an idea and actually distilling it down into something that is that can really capture the imagination. And it's kind of, you know, th three good things that can happen. And, and then people are ready to listen and sort of start, what's the vision you have? And, and then, yes, there's data underneath that you need and all that sort of stuff. But there is this kind of, if you can come forward with the, this is, this is how I envision, envision the future for a citizen in our patch, and it could be so much better if we did this and why that would be better and you know, why the government would save lots of money is always a winner and, um, and those sorts of things. But you know, why it would take calls off a call centre you know, is the facts underneath it. But fundamentally selling that vision is the thing. And I, and I know people like the Chief Minister you know, very, very into that. What is, the, what is the vision? Really wants to hear it. Um, I can be a bit more subversive because I'm not in government at the moment. Um, and I guess the other thing you can look at is you can always go around it. One of the beautiful things about the internet is it routes around damage. Bureaucracy is considered damage in internet terms. So the first thing you can do, you have this wonderful information from the community about the community. So share it back to the community through the public channels that are available, through the media, through local newsletters, through other things. So the community actually, and then gets the community together and say, we've identified through our community that we have these issues. Why don't we sit down as a community and come up with some solutions? And we'll invite a couple of people from the government along as well to actually be part of that conversation. So if you think of it as uh, something along, there's obviously a lot of people have heard of hackathons and similar sort of things, and there's, been, there, there's literally a couple every week going on now across Australia. Um, they are good for solving problems because they bring people together in a supportive environment to actually do that. Um, we have other similar events, like we have um, Unconference Canberra coming up on the 9th of April here in, in Canberra, which is another place where you get communities together to discuss and solve problems. So engage the community in actually solving the problem that the community is seeing. 
Like firstly, you might find things that you can then build into a business case, which is a vision to government, and you also might find things that the community can actually solve on their own without getting government more deeply involved. Libraries are a central place for the community. You don't just have to be the passive custodians of knowledge. You can be active facilitators of community conversations and engagement. So you're not just a passive role anymore. Absolutely. Can I just add to that one of the challenges with any government is to actually get that feedback of a genuine cross-section. It's usually the same old characters that turn up with their opinionated views through the media or, or whatever. And, and I know for any government, getting that genuine broad, broad spectrum of, of consideration, often particularly younger people who are going to inherit whatever the government does, it can be a real challenge. And also timing is crucial. It's an election year. That's always a good, a good thing. <laughs> um, I would like now to uh, hand over to uh, NSLA project managers of the Literacy and Learning Project, project Anya Tate and Rebecca Ong. Thank you. And thank you once again to our panel. that we have gone very far over time so I do apologise but it was fantastic to have that engagement and I'm sorry for the gentleman that didn't get to ask his question in that last panel session. Hopefully you can catch them on the way out and continue that discussion. Um, thank you all very much for coming. We often get asked why we're playing in this space and as the Literacy and Learning Group um, that's come out of the NSLA libraries, our goal is to engage people in discussion about the role of libraries in the learning space and we believe that digital citizenship is key to that. So it's really important to us to continue this discussion and to build on it. We were ho hoping to have a few more government representatives in the building. Um, now, John did say invite them, or sorry, Craig said invite the government and engage them in the discussion. We're going to keep trying. We don't always get there but we will keep getting those invitations out and keep trying to get that discussion going. We were invited to summarise and close the session as we've gone so over time and we feel that the two panel sessions were a wonderful summary of breadth and depth of the conversation. We would like to say goodbye and thank you for your time today. And thank you to NLA for hosting.